Hi, this is E.T., and this is Ingemar Johansson, former undisputed heavyweight boxing champion, early 1960s. Johansson, from Sweden, silver medal winner in the 1952 Olympics. He turned pro in 1955. He was undefeated early on, scoring a run of KOs against quality opponents. And then in 1959, early, he meets Eddie Machen. Machen, at the time undefeated, victories over Nino Valdez, Joey Maxim, Tommy Jackson. Uh, later on, Machen's going to fight Sonny Liston, Jerry Quarry, other really good fighters. And it's quite apparent that he's going to beat Johansson, and then he'll get the title shot against Floyd Patterson. Well, that was not to be. Ingemar applied his famed hammer of Tor, which put Machen out in round one and guaranteed Johansson the title shot. Now stay with me for E.T.'s short involvement with gambling. It had begun during Johansson's uh, first battle with Patterson. Meanwhile, let's examine Ingemar Johansson's training protocol and the media blitz, the TV, radio, and film uh, that hit him. And let's look at how quick fame and adulation, in particular of the female type, can derail a boxer's career. All right, first, the Swedes training. Even before the Olympics, Johansson's training was, and I'm putting it gently, lackadaisical. His right hand, was so good that it made it unnecessary to develop a lot of endurance and to mix it up too much in the ring during training. You can see from his handsome features that he avoided punishment, at least early on, the kind of punishment that leads to cauliflower ears and uh, flattened noses and, unfortunately, traumatic brain injury. Johansson's right hand, Ingo's bingo, proved to be his undoing. In other words, this gift is like a two-edged sword. Uh, you're so good that you never really need to learn the art of self-defense. An example would be Muhammad Ali, extremely fast, the greatest footwork ever. He was not an effective boxer. He had to study from somebody who wasn't so good with the speed and footwork, Willie Pastrano. So, is E.T. hinting that Ingemar Johansson was lazy? Uh, yeah, and it was apparent from his amateur days. He was denied victory over Ed Saunders, who won the gold medal in 52, because, so ruled the judges, uh, uh, Johansson was passive in the ring. Uh, now, that's something he'd get away with as a pro. Uh, what he would do is uh, backpedal, flick the left jab. He'd wait for his opponent to drop the guard, and then he'd release his tunder and lightning right hand. But to be fair to Johansson, uh, Ingemar was told uh, not to uh, get too aggressive with Sanders, and he had only 10 days training. But, but, consider that most top fighters of whatever era try to maintain, at least on their own, some degree of fitness year around, and uh, they train very hard months prior to a fight. I'm thinking of Jack Dempsey, Sonny Liston, Marciano. Each of these greats knew from experience, either as an amateur or pro, what lack of conditioning can do. Let's look at Johansson's training. It reminded me of that character, Lord Andrew Lindsay. He was in the movie Chariots of Fire, which was based on the 1924 Olympics. Uh, was it Nigel Havers? I think it was who played him. Anyway, you'll see the character leisurely training uh, for the Olympics on his estate. Uh, he will stroll over to the hurdles that have been set up by his valet and on which are perched, you know, glasses filled with champagne. Uh, that reminds me of uh, Ingemar Johansson's training style. Now, there's one exception to this story. 
and that was when he trained for the first Patterson fight. He actually got serious about this one. It's for the championship belt. Yankee Stadium, uh, June 26, 1959. The champion, Floyd Fat Patterson, is a 5-1 to one favorite. And that's spurring Ingemar Johansson to get into some kind of shape. And you can see that he came into the fight conditioned, at least for Ingemar. And he did not appear to be winded by the time of his third round knockout of the champion, Floyd Patterson. An amazing performance, by the way, for both men as Ingo put the champion down seven times and Patterson kept getting up until referee Ruby Goldstein stopped it. I said already, Johansson trained for this bout more rigorously than usual, but his workouts at Grossinger's and the Catskills didn't even approach the Spartan training and dieting that we think of when we look at Marciano or Archie Moore, some of the greats way back. Also, his training, talking about Johansson's, was interrupted by constant visits by the press, radio, newspapers, cameramen for movie tone news, television, autograph seekers, and of course the girls. Ingo, by the way, kept slipping away from his camp at night with some girl pal and end up at a nightclub. And I'm talking about training for the first Patterson fight. Things didn't get better for their uh, second one. Right after the first fight, he wasn't training at all, not for months. Uh, he goes off to Sweden with his beautiful girlfriend, Berkat Lundgren, and she was soon to be his wife. Uh, hometown celebrations and then uh, all around the country. He did interviews. He'd be featured in Sports Illustrated, Life Magazine, just, just about everywhere. You could see his photograph or hear his heavily accented English. He was in the movies. Uh, what was it? All the young men, I think. Uh, Alan Ladd, who else? Sidney Poitier. He'd be on TV in the United States and in Europe. He'd be seen at night spots. Uh, oh, yeah, and then he would go to foreign countries. I think it was in April of 1960, just weeks before a second fight with Patterson, he's in Egypt proposing to uh, uh, Lundgren. One day prior to the June 19, 1960 second fight, you can see Ingemar Johansson on television on What's My Line? He's the mystery guest. Now let's take a look at the second fight. He appeared, Johansson, to knowing observers of the game of boxing, the least prepared heavyweight to fight this kind of bout since the sick James J. Jeffries, whose doctor told him he was about to die, stepped into the ring with uh, Jack Johnson. That was after Jeffries lost 100 pounds. And Patterson, who was not even visited by the mainstream press, uh, had vigorously trained under his uh, mentor, Gus D'Amato, who, by the way, later trained Mike Tyson. Uh, you can look at Patterson. You see he's fit and muscled. And the result was a very lackluster four rounds. And then Patterson leaps up with a left hook coming right to the chin of Johansson. Johansson's going to slam onto the canvas and stay there for five minutes. This was the most devastating punch in heavyweight history, I think. Now, E.T. was not surprised. He had followed Johansson's training. E.T. was greatly disturbed by the twitching foot, as were, I am sure, the panelists on What's My Line?, all the moviegoers, and the teen girls who had chased Ingo around for months. Now you may think, Ingemar Johansson has learned a lesson, and now he's training very hard for a third fight with Patterson. This is what we call a rubber match, back and forth. So who's going to win two out of three? But the fact is, Ingemar Johansson trained even worse than he did for the second fight. This is despite far fewer distractions. Uh, the press is not so ubiquitous. Uh, the general public is a bit cynical now. 
famous sports columnist, uh, A.J. Liebling, I think he wrote this one in The New Yorker, and it said that Ingemar Johansson's uh, dining table for the third fight was pretty much full of cream dishes, cheesecakes, and uh, when it came to training, there was hardly any at all. And you can see it when uh, you take a look at his midsection in the third fight. Now, the thir third fight actually was very even. In fact, E.T. had given the uh, decision so far to Ingemar Johansson. But Ingo ran out of gas by round six, and the referee stopped it. So is this it for Ingemar Johansson? Is he out of boxing? Uh, no, he would uh, continue on for a while, and he won every bout uh, against Joe Bygraves and Dick Richardson and Brian London. Although in that last fight with Brian London, Ingo, although he wins the decision, is so gassed that he was vulnerable to a hit from London in the last seconds of the bout. And uh, you can see the newspaper photos of Ingemar Johansson climbing up the ropes while London towers over him. And a newspaper in Sweden will say, look with that picture on the front page, uh, wake up, Ingo, you won. Anyway, it's so embarrassing for Ingemar Johansson that he's out of the game. And he goes into business. Uh, what did he produce? A, a lager beer, and I forgot the name of it. Came out with a clothing line. And then there was boxing promoting. And in 1966 and uh, 67, he invites the former champion Sonny Liston, who, by the way, had beaten Floyd Patterson and then himself had uh, been beaten, maybe, by uh, Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali. I'd say maybe because there's a real question whether Sonny Liston threw his two fights against Muhammad Ali. Anyway, there is Sonny Liston with Ingemar Johansson in Sweden. He gets four fights and a lot of money. Uh, Johansson is eventually living in Florida. He owns a fishing boat in Pompano Beach. And by the mid-1970s, finally realizing the importance of conditioning, he begins uh, running marathons. And he, began to, and he did that for about uh, 10 years. Oftentimes, he'd be running with his old pal, Floyd Patterson. The two would attend conventions together into the 1990s. They'd sign autographs, and, and uh, if they couldn't do that, they always made it together regardless of where the each was living, at least one time a year. But by the mid-1990s, neither Johansson nor Patterson could uh, visit because the damage, much of it visited by one upon the other in those three fights. The damage was such that it led to Alzheimer's-type dementia for both Johansson and Patterson. Ingemar spent about the last decade or so of his life in a Swedish nursing home. In 2009, at the age of 76, he died. Patterson, suffering from that same malady, had died three years earlier at the age of 71. Well, E.T. mentioned a personal story. Let's go back to 1959. E.T. is age 15. And having wasted too many school days pursuing anything and everything but study, E.T. Uh, decided to put his mind, such as it was, to work. Now, E.T. was very much an Ingemar Johansson fan, and he began to study all the ring magazines and Boxing Illustrated and others that dealt with the fight game. He began to study actuarial kinds of uh, things, and figured out, after playing around with the numbers, that Ingemar Johansson would win, and we're talking about the first fight, and would knock out Patterson in round three. And he wagered with his several pals about that, because nobody thought Ingemar would win, let alone win by a third round KO. Well, it turned out exactly as predicted. And when E.T. went to collect his debts, nobody had any money. 
So that was a lesson learned. Well, another lesson that was learned was this. If anybody's going to go into the fight game, whether as a trainer or as a fighter, you have to be in excellent shape because nothing's worse than being in a ring, being pounded on, kicked sometimes if you're talking about MMA, and you're uh, unable to defend yourself because you don't have any energy. Well, what do you think? Did uh, you enjoy this? If you did, say so down below. If you have any other comments to make, write those in too. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. If you did not, give it a thumbs down. I really don't care. I do care, however, that you subscribe to this channel. Thank you.